Let's give an even greater applause to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We worship you in this house. Hallelujah. We glorify your name, Jesus. Oh, we're so thankful, Lord, for all you are doing, for all you have done, and what you're going to continue to do in each and every one of our lives. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, you're worthy, Jesus. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a blessing to be here before you today. Amen. And uh, I'll go further into some of the introductions, but first I'd like to introduce, as you have seen already, she is my better half, and I'm talking about way better half, amen? My wife, Michelle, and I'd like for her to come up and, and greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Bishop, she, uh, the Lord has spoken to my wife to share some to the church, and she would like to release it, if that's okay. Praise the Lord, church. I'm a soul that Jesus saved. Aren't you so glad that Jesus saved you? That he filled you with his spirit? There's nothing better. There's nothing better than to know Jesus. There's no greater name than the name of Jesus. And I just want to share with you uh, a word that the Lord gave me for this church while I was in prayer 12 days ago. Uh, our pastor gave us a call on the way here this morning, and um, he didn't know what the Lord placed on my heart, and he said, don't be afraid to go into the prophetic. And so I'll share this with you for the Acts 2 church. It's the seventh time. The prophet came to the Shunammite son who died and came back to life. He sneezed seven times. Naaman, who grudgingly followed the prophets, instructed, dipped into the river seven times, and he was healed. This is the seventh time. This is the end time church. And there is a city for you to reach. And you may feel that you can't, but you can because you have the power of the Holy Ghost within you. And this is the scripture that the Lord gave me to share with you, Joshua 6.16. And it shall come to pass at the seventh time. When the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. I'm wondering if we could shout right now and thank God because the Lord has given you this city. Let's shout with a voice of triumph. Let's shout with a voice of praise. Hallelujah. Thank God for his encouragement. Hallelujah. Oh, God's got a plan. The presence of God is thick in this house. Amen. And this is a praying church. The Lord showed me when I walked in here. This is a praying church. Amen. And when you're a praying people, you don't need somebody to come up and whip you up into shape. You already know what to do when you come into the house of God. And I thank God because God's going to use this praying church to enlarge its territory, to affect the community out there. He's already doing it with Bishop by giving them increased influence. He's going to do the same thing with Acts 2 Ministries. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Before I minister before you today, my daughter, Ari, you're going to sing after? Okay, so she's going to sing after then. So we'll go right into the word. Amen? So first of all, I want to thank God for Bishop Hansen and for First Lady Hansen. Amen? Uh, for allowing us to come here today. Amen? I want to say something uh, about, you know, First Lady Hansen. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a service. Our church went to Southington, River of Life. We had a combined service. And Sister Tryon was up there playing the piano, and, and she was playing what you call those oldie but goodies, amen? Those songs when I was, you know, yay high, and we were worshiping, and, you know, some of the 
younger people may not think it's hip or whatever the case may be. But what y'all young people got to understand, it's the anointing that comes from that music. Amen. And Sister Hanson, when you were up there playing those keys, I felt the anointing and the presence of God. And y'all young people, enter in. It may not be hip to you. It may not be cutting edge. But the presence of God is behind it. And let that impact you. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I want to thank God for uh, my pastor, Pastor Scott Vieira and First Lady Jeannie Vieira uh, for their release for us to come here today in the house of prayer. And so we're grateful, amen, for our pastor and his First Lady for the love and the mentorship that they have provided for us. Amen. And again, I'm thankful for my wife and my daughter. Again, as Bishop alluded to before, amen, when I met uh, my future wife and we were courting, I was, had the Holy Ghost, amen, but I didn't, believe, I didn't know the oneness of God, amen? And I'll tell you, when I got baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, and I was baptized by that name and not by titles, I got out of that water and I felt an electricity that I never felt before, and I'm telling you right now, I haven't looked back. We are walking in truth. Why do we need to be afraid of what the devil says and the lies that he tells us when we've got the truth that will set people free? Amen. So let's continue to walk in encouragement. Hallelujah. By the truth of God. Amen. Amen. So without further ado, can you please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. Gavis, say amen. And I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, amen. I know the King James is the authorized version. I read it too, amen. <laughs> but I do love this translation, amen. And the word says in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. And so for a few moments this morning, I'd like to preach on this subject, limping restoration, limping worship. Limping restoration, limping worship. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask, Lord God, for your anointing, Lord God, to fall upon me right now. Lord, your presence is already here. And it's a thick presence in this house right now, Lord God. You have set forth the atmosphere. And Lord, now I ask, Lord, that I may decrease and you may increase, Lord God. Oh, that your plans and purposes will be accomplished before us today, Lord God. Oh, Lord, have your way, Lord God. Control everything from here on out, Lord God. Let it be done not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, Lord God, we pray. Lord, that you would open up everyone's ears and hearts and minds, Lord God. This is a word of encouragement today, Lord God. This is a praying church, Lord God. But that doesn't mean because we're a praying church, as Bishop alluded to before, that that we're not going through some circumstances and we're not going through some situations and we're not going through some attacks but we thank you Lord for the process that you have brought us through Lord God and I pray Lord God that that process would be made open to us today Lord God so that we can walk confidently Lord and trust in your will and purpose for our lives we ask this all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen and amen you may be seated So the Bible talks about in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, a man who by faith, as he was dying, leaning upon the top of his staff, and has said this about him, he worshiped. I hope it could be said of us that when we get older in our lives and our races are run, not that we are bitter and mad and angry and hateful, but that we still have a spirit of worship, to love the brethren, to love the church, and to worship the God that we serve. As we look at this text in Hebrews 11, I find it interesting that which is often this chapter called the Hall of Faith or the Faith Hall of Fame, that this verse was meant to be there. Everything that is in the Bible, God meant it to be there. In this one verse, 
verse 21, there is this final characterization of Jacob that not only did it talk about that he was in his last days as he was dying, not only did it talk about that it was by faith, not only did it talk about that he was worshiping, but the Bible goes another step and tells us that he was leaning on his staff while he worshiped. Why in the world would the Bible and the book of Hebrews talk about this? To find that answer, we have to go back to the book of Genesis chapter 25. And I'm not going to go through the verses for the sake of time. But Esau and Jacob had been at it for their entire lives. We know that Esau and Jacob were wrestling within the womb and Jacob grabbed the heel of Esau as we see in this picture. Amen? It started from the time they were babies. Esau is coming out. Jacob is a heel grabber. He's trying to grab Esau by the heel. He grabs him by the ankle. They're trying to pull him back in. There is a war that is absolutely raging for the birthright of who is going to be the firstborn. You understand there is much significance here. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and it should have been the God of Esau. But instead, there is a war for this birthright. Later, it becomes not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There's much to be said of this war between the two of them. It went on through their lives. Esau was daddy's boy. Jacob was mama's boy. Esau went hunting, came home hungry, would have gave everything he had. Jacob tricks him to sell the birthright for some lentil stew and bread. Now, I don't have time to preach this, but never sell eternal things for temporal things. Can somebody say amen? amen. And we find that as this story ensues and goes even further, that Jacob being mama's boy and Esau being daddy's boy, Esau is to get the blessing. Jacob is not. The time goes on. Their father Isaac is getting old. His eyes are turning blind. We pick up the story back in Genesis chapter 27, verse 1. Jacob and his mama Rebekah hatch up a scheme of which he, Jacob, can steal the birthright from Esau. He goes in there and puts on the coat of skin on his arms, goes to his daddy, and his daddy begins to ask him about this. And Jacob puts out his arms, and Isaac validates his arms and believes that Jacob is Esau because Esau was a hairy man. Jacob was not a hairy man, and Jacob leaves with the blessing of the father. Only for Esau to come later, ask for the blessing and for the father to relay the message that the blessing had already been given. In that moment, there is a war between do these two people. In this moment, there is a battle that is between these two people that would ensue for 21 years. There's the manipulation of the birthright for 21 years. Jacob has found out that the blessing has become a curse. Let me say this. If you got to steal it to get it, don't call it a blessing. Can somebody say amen? We find that Jacob comes by and realizes that this thing has become a curse to him. For 21 years, Jacob absolutely fears the day that he'll have to meet up with Esau. And for 21 years, Esau has been planning revenge to get things even. And we find that things ensue and Jacob's life goes in so many different directions that he finally gets into the place that he just wants to be right. How many know that story? That God had to take you through a journey and take you through a place. And all this time you thought God was punishing you. But he was not punishing you. He was lovingly correcting you in order to get you into the place that he wanted you to get into so that you can have the encounter that you need to be transformed. Can somebody say amen? amen. So Jacob is tired of the baggage. He's tired of the cloud over his head. 
He's tired of all these things, and he wants to have a meeting with Esau. All these things go on. He sends people by, and in the middle of the night, he wrestles with God, and God breaks his thigh. And all that goes along with that. And then God breaking him and God touching him in the thigh was producing the limp that he lived with the rest of his life, which the book of Hebrews declares that he leaned upon the top of his staff. What if I told you that some things you're never going to get over? Does that encourage you? What if I told you there's going to be some things that we will limp with the rest of our lives? But I come to tell somebody that we all think, well, if I get a promotion or if I get to do this or if I get to do that, then I'll really have something to praise God for. But I come to tell you the reverse of it. That some of the greatest seasons of worship do not come from your leap, they come from your limp. Oh, can somebody say hallelujah? I said your greatest seasons of worship will not come from your leap, they'll come from your limp. We've got places to go, hallelujah. Number one, my limp, our limp. If we go and interview Mr. Jacob in his dying days, and he's sitting there on his staff, leaning on his staff and worshiping, if we were to ask him a question, Mr. Jacob, what are you worshiping for? What are you worshiping over? Number one, I believe it would be something to say like this, that my limp reminds me of a barren season. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, it said that Jacob was left alone. Jacob was left alone. May I say that God does his best work when he separates us and when God pulls us to the side. It may feel like detention. It may feel like you're in trouble. But sometimes God cannot get our attention while everybody's clapping, and God can't get our attention while everything's good. God can't get our attention while there's money in the bank and everything is going great. So every now and then, God's got to get us all alone and by ourselves. It may feel like depression. It may feel like anxiety. It may feel like abandonment. It may feel like persecution. It may feel like your wife or your husband left you or aren't paying attention to you. It may feel like you lost your job. But I'm telling you, some of those times we blame on the devil, and the devil has absolutely nothing to do with it. It is God knowing that he's got something great for you in the future. It is, God, it is God saying to you, I've got a plan for you. I know where this ends. You may not know where this ends, but I know where this ends. Just stay here with me. Stay with me. Stay connected. Stay with the, in a place where you can receive an encounter with me, and you will have that confidence that I am in the midst of your situation. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And God says, if I'm going to make you what I want to make you, I've got to break you like I've got to break you to get you to the place where I'm the clay in the potter's hands again. Oh, God wants us to have that attitude. Lord, I want to be the clay that's in the potter's hands again, where I don't try to control what goes on here, Lord God. You are the one that molds. You're the one that makes. You're the one that breaks. You're the one that shapes. Lord, I want to be in a position, Lord, where I give myself to the creator to accomplish what I cannot accomplish on my own. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. And so his limp reminded him of a barren season. It is the times God gets us by ourselves where he wants us to teach us two things. Number one, God was teaching Jacob humility. All Jacob's life, he was a manipulator. Well, God wasn't fair to me. 
daddy isn't being fair to me. Mama isn't being fair to me. I deserve what Esau has. And if God won't give it to me, and my dad won't give it to me, and my mom won't give it to me, I'll go get it myself. How many of us have been in that place before? I, I know I have. I'll go get it myself. I got the birthright myself. I got the blessing from my father myself. So God had to teach him humility. Promotion is God's job. Humility is our job. But when we try to do God's job, he will do our job. And God will teach us humility. God gets him in a place where he's all alone. God gets him in a place where he re realizes my manipulation has caused me a mess and he's realizing humility. Number two, God was teaching him honesty. In the middle of this war, when God gets him all by himself, in the middle of the night, there comes one and wrestles with him until the breaking of the day. And the Bible said that when he saw that, he prevailed not against him, that he touched the hollow of his thigh. And when he touched the hollow of his thigh, he broke the joints here and he hurt the joints. And now Jacob will limp the rest of his life. And he goes from wrestling and trying to get the person off of him to trying to keep him on him. Oh, can somebody testify to that right now? You may complain at times that the enemy is in a situation or the devil is doing this to me. And sometimes we give the devil too much credit. But sometimes God has got to get into the middle of the situation. He has to cause something to happen where we get into a place of humility. We get into a place of honesty. Why? He wants us to cling to him. Why? He'd rather have us in a place where we're clinging to him than when we're trying to do it in our own strength, in our own mind, so that we can get into a place where we realize, God, this is bigger than me. God, this is too much for me. I need to hang on to you for dear life so that I can accomplish and do what you have called and purpose for me to do. Can somebody say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Jacob was forced to get to this place where he said, I will not leave you until you bless me. I will not leave you until you bless me. Now, the conversation's going to get interesting. God has finally got him humble and asking the right person. God's finally got him asking the right person for a promotion. And God said, okay, now I can bless you. And God can bless you. And God can bless you. And God can bless me. But before God can give Jacob the blessing, there's a couple questions that need to be answered. Whose blessing do you want? Do you want Esau's blessing? Or do you want Jacob's blessing? Because, Mr. Jacob, all your life, all you've ever thought is, I'm a God that I guess is not strong enough to bless Esau and Jacob. Because all you've been doing is chasing Esau's blessing, and you don't have a clue that I'm God enough. You see, that happens in church sometimes. You're asking for a need. You've been praying to God. God, I've been crying out to you for you to, uh, to be in this situation. You may be calling for healing or breakthrough or open, open door at a job. And you're in church and people are testifying. And a sister and a brother are sitting here and they're testifying about everything that God is doing. And all of a sudden you can get hit with a spirit of jealousy and say, well, God, what am I doing different than this person? I'm praying. I'm seeking the Lord. But why are they getting blessed? And I'm not getting blessed. But that's not what God, the attitude God wants us to have. He wants us to celebrate another person's testimony. If somebody got blessed, if somebody got healed, if somebody got promoted, I'm going to celebrate the Lord like he did it for me. And you will see with that kind of attitude how quickly the Lord will open the door for you. Can somebody give the Lord a mighty hand of praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. 
God will bless this person and that person within our church. We ain't got to fight with each other. We ain't got to bicker with each other. God can bless you and can bless them. He's big enough to bless everybody. Amen? And so this war begins to ensue. And God says, all right, if you want your blessing, then we got to get down to business here. Because I got to teach you some honesty. And here's the one question under divine inspiration that God asked Jacob. If you want a blessing and you want your blessing, here's the only question you got to answer. And God says this, what's your name? Now you say that's just a question. No, that's more than just a question. It's making a wrong right. It's God getting to the core of the issue. You see, the last time the Bible records, somebody in some way asked him who he was. He held out his arms saying, I'm Esau. Hear me. If you write anything down, I say write this down. God cannot bless the person you're pretending to be. God cannot and will not bless the person you're pretending to be. All of us have different upbringings and experiences. We've had parents, guardians, mentors, role models, worldly or spiritual influences in our lives. We've had different occupational or educational experiences. I, for one, have been a minister, a politician, etc. But one of the best days of my life, Bishop, was when I realized God didn't need me to be another politician. God didn't need me to be a Jeff Arnold. God doesn't need me to be a Johnny James or, or a Pastor V or a Bishop Hanson. He gave me my own thumbprint. He gave you your own thumbprint. God made me to be me. I got my own style. I don't sit home and say, well, when I get to this point, I'm going to inflect my voice. I'm going to preach like this. It's just who I am. I can't be somebody else because of what you want me to be. This is how you may preach. This is the way someone else might preach. At another church, they might like getting loud. But if they go into another house, they could do things their way. But we, all we could do is be who God made us to be. Some of us have different people that we reach. Some churches are in the inner city, and you have certain types of folks and certain types of circumstances in that church. God is going to make you and equip you what you need to be to reach those people in that area. But we can't be a carbon copy of someone else. You are going to be what God has designed for Acts 2 Ministries to be and for the harvest that is out there, that is plentiful, that God wants you to bring in. You can't be somebody else. You got to be what God has called you to be. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We worship you. And I'll tell you, in this day and hour, we're producing a bunch of clones that have to talk the same way, sing the same way, act the same way, when in reality, God designed you to be you. He wants you to be you, but in righteousness, not in sin. Because some people will go to, well, I'm just trying to be me. Well, if you're living in sin, the bishop ain't trying to go to you to try to change who your personality is. He's saying, well, you could be what God called you to be in the pers unique personality you have, but you got to do it living in righteousness and not living in sin and living opposed to the word of God and his commandments. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. God We'll get, it's given us a bunch in our generation that'll say, I can't be you, you can't be me, but I'm going to be the best that God ever made me to be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God teaches them honesty and humility. Mr. Jacob, what are you worshiping over? I'm worshiping about a barren season because it was in that barren season. When it, I was left alone, and God made me humble, and God made me honest. Number two, he was thankful for his broken season. It was in this broken season where God surgically, and God doesn't do anything by accident. 
God surgically touches him in the hollow of his thigh. When God broke him there in the design and in the creation of the way God formed us. And the hips are the strongest joint that God made us with. And in there, there is a certain posture. Number one, they call it static posture. Static posture is what God created me with that gives me the ability to stand on my own. So when God touches him in the hollow of his thigh, he was taking away his ability to stand on his own. Not only is static posture relying inside those hips, but dynamic posture resides in those hips. Not only did God take away in static posture his ability to stand on his own, but dynamic posture takes away the ability to walk on his own. My God. Because all of Jacob's life, his blessing was contingent on whether he could stand up for himself and whether he could walk for himself. But God said, if you want my blessing on your life, it ain't got nothing to do with you. And it's got everything to do with him. Hallelujah. What a joy it is when you get to the end of yourself. What a joy it is. If there's anything good in me or anything good in you, it's not because of you and me. It's because of the goodness of God. Can we say hallelujah to the Lamb of God? And when you get to the end of yourself and surrender your life to God by repenting, getting baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins and being filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, God can write your life better than you could have ever wrote it. God can take you to places that you could have never went by yourself. Mr. Jacob is worshiping about the broken season in his life. Your worship is not the best because of how you leap. It's because of how low you've been and the limp you have the rest of your life. Can somebody say amen? amen. If this sounds like an oxymoron sermon, it is an oxymoron sermon. Amen? Number three, number three, Mr. Jacob is worshiping over his blessed season. Jacob has his encounter with God. His hollow of his thigh has been broken, and he goes up on the scene. He's about to have this encounter with Esau. From the outside looking in, it looks like it's going to be a David and Goliath story. Esau is down there with all his people, 400 strong. Jacob's up there with all his people. Esau has planned this day for 21 years. Jacob has planned this day. For 21 years. The only thing in the narrative that nobody was expecting. Jacob's wives. His kids. Esau. And his people. But as Esau was coming. Jacob. Was coming over the mountain. And I can attest this. I can just feel this even though you read it. The scripture at face value, but I can just sense what Esau was seeing. Over the mountain was not an arrogant Jacob, an angry Jacob, or a man manipulative, lying Jacob. I could just see Jacob going over the mountain. It wasn't the Jacob that was that stole the birthright. It wasn't even the Jacob that had to go live with Laban and serve Laban for 14 years. It's Jacob had a limp. He had just wrestled with God. Jacob's thinking, when Esau sees me, he's going to kill me. And I'm sure Esau had that mind. Outside, as soon as he goes up that mountain, Jacob is limping towards Esau. A limping Jacob. The Bible may not say it, but you got to ask yourself the question. 
What in the world changes the heart of Esau from killing Jacob? I'll tell you what I think it was. This story goes from being a David and Goliath story to it looks like a prodigal son. What softened the heart of, of Esau? I'll tell you what I think it was. God used the limp of Jacob to soften the heart of Esau. Esau runs to him, falls on him, and kisses him. That which is wrong has been made right. And we don't know, but I dare to say, if an arrogant Jacob would have walked on the scene, Jacob, or I should say Esau, would have got his revenge. But he's worshiping, and he's still alive. Hallelujah. There was a part when I was in politics, and I'll say this for a brief moment as I, as I close. I was at the end of my term on the city council. I had served for six years. And in the last two or three months, there was a situation that had happened, and there was a, a man that I'd known since I was young. I actually met Pastor V through this, through this man. Lived in his house. I mean, we had such a, a profound relationship. I saw him when he got filled with the Holy Ghost and just a lot of spiritual encounters. But when I got into politics, something had happened with our relationship. We had differences of opinion on a lot of the political views, and it caused friction between us. Our relationship was, in, was shattered. Something had happened where he had approached me on something, and I didn't handle it the right way. I wasn't as forthcoming as I should have been. And it caused a situation to happen to me and happen to him. I was in a place where I was going to God and I say, Lord, I don't know what something had happened when, and I know some of you can attest to this when, when in your past or whatever, where you, you make a decision or, or, and then all of a sudden you feel like, God, have you departed from me? God, I feel alone. I feel like you're not answering my prayers. I'm seeking you, Lord. You're not speaking to me. I was in a dark place in my mind. Fast forward. He was going through his own situation. He needed a kidney. He was on his deathbed in the hospital. And I found out from Pastor V, they say he's dying. And I remember calling him, crying, say, please don't tell me you're dying. He said, I don't think I'm going to make it, Christian. And he said on his phone, hey, I forgive you for everything. If there's anything I've ever done to you, I forgive you. And I said the same thing, I forgive you. But something miraculous happened, just like Jacob and Esau. It was a process of forgiveness where then all of a sudden the blessing could enter in. At the same moment that God had me broken and before the altar and teaching me humility and honesty and all those other things in order for God to do the work he wanted to do in my life for what he's called me to be. He was in search of a kidney. By the grace of God, we prayed for this man, Pastor V, went to the hospital and he was able to be released. But at that moment, when God at the same time was doing a work in me that has forever changed my life, I was there at the moment when he called him and he said, guess what, Brother Christian? They found me a kidney. And I was able... I took the drive to the hospital, and I was in that hospital room with him as they wheeled him to go get a new kidney. And I can attest to you right now, in the midst of that limp, in the midst of that broken season, he has a limp, I had a limp, but that limp caused us to come together and to let bygones be bygones. I come to tell you, your greatest time of worship isn't in your leap, it's in your limp. Can somebody stand up and say, God, I thank you for the limp in my life because it has taught me honesty, humility, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. 
Hallelujah for making things right. Oh, we thank you for making things right, Lord. Oh, shut up, I'm sick. Oh, shake it, baby. I want to say this in closing. You be seated. Jacob, after that encounter, we know that he had those 12 sons, and we know the story of Joseph, and again, Jacob had to suffer again because of what they did to Joseph. Jacob lived with that lie for 22 years. Esau lived with Jacob's lie for 21 years. Jacob lives with his son's lie for 22 years. Listen, God can restore anyone, and God can fix your situation. But sometimes we have to accept that we have to pay for a decision that was made. It may not be the most comfortable situation. Even David, after he had to repent for Bathsheba, still had to pay and experience something because of what had happened but God can still make all things right. Amen? To God be the glory. But that day comes when it looked like God was absent, that behind the scenes, God was working another plan through Jacob's son. Joseph, through slavery, through the prisons, through the palace, Potiphar's house, through the prison, and then elevated to the second most high, second most powerful man in the world. And we know the story, Jacob's family gets hungry, and he sends the boys to Egypt, and guess who's sitting on the throne in Egypt? And you know how Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and then to his father. Jacob's spirit was revived. I am almost sure that when Jacob saw Joseph, his spirit was revived. God's going to revive some spirits here today. Amen to the Lamb of God. Here's what I look in closing. Here's what I see in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21. Is Jacob, as he was dying, he's leaning on his staff. He's looking back over his life. And he's remembering everything that he went through. He's remembering the day that God taught him humility in honesty. The day God broke him and his limp for the rest of his life. But if it hadn't been for that limp, things would have never been made right with God and with Esau. Who knows where Jacob would have been after that. All the saga of Joseph, who he thought was dead, God was faithful. Joseph wasn't dead. God sent him the long way around for the future of the seed that God promised to continue through Joseph, through Jacob. So you say, limp in restoration, limp in worship. Jacob is blessing, as you see in that picture. Joseph's two sons, Ephraim. And Manasseh. The meaning of Ephraim's name is fruitful. The meaning of Manasseh's name is God has made me forget entirely all my troubles. When Jacob was leaning on that staff, he was remembering everything God had brought him through, and it came forward in the blessing. Upon Joseph's sons. He was not only blessing them, he was prophesying and testifying of his own experience. So I've come to encourage you, you can all stand up. I've come to encourage you today. As Bishop alluded to before, some of you are going through some situations right now. Some of you have been battling your whole lives. Some of you love God, you love Him. You have, an experience, you have experienced him. You seek him. 
Some of y'all may not be seeking him and, and are going through a different type of battle. But God wants to encourage you here today. If you're limping, worship him through your limp. If you're limping, give the Lord all the praise, the glory, and the honor you can give him. Because, Lord, there's a reason why I'm limping. You got me limping because you want me to hang on to you. And, Lord, before I would blame the devil for my limp, I would blame every single other situation and circumstance for my limp. But, God, I realize today you were behind it the whole time. Your fingerprints and your hand was behind my limp the whole time. So, God, I thank you that the limp that I now have is a symbol that you have restored me to my rightful place and that you, Lord God, are worthy of the worship and the glory and the honor. As my daughter comes up to play, hallelujah, I'd like to give an altar call. Bishop, if that's okay with you, we all know who we are. This isn't time to pretend. This isn't a time to be superficial. This is a time to be real. And we all know what our experiences have been. Jacob reflected. That's what God wants us to do here. Reflect. If you came in here complaining about life, if you came in here and all you can think about is all the negative situations that are going on in your life and that is stopping you from reflecting all the good that God has done for you, this is your moment to make it right with God. This is your moment. If you've been like Jacob before where you try to do it your own way, you're doing it in your own strength and you're not depending and leaning on God, this is your opportunity now to make it right before God. And to say, Lord, I want to be honest and humble before you. I want to just throw it all out there. You start with God, but you also have a bishop and a a spiritual authority over you. And I will say this, I could not be where I am today, and I'm still a work in progress, without being accountable to God but to my spiritual authority you think they haven't heard it all they've heard a lot of things but it's okay to be open about your struggles it's okay to be real about who you are and where you are God has a calling for this church and he has vessels that he's willing to use but he can't do it if you're superficial about where you are and who you are. So the altars are open, and we're going to be praying, hallelujah, for God to restore people in this house today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, hallelujah.